expanding impossible. To offset this risk, both struts were fitted with a cartridge that would blow the surviving wheel clear. The Stuka was by no means defenseless. Both single and dual mount machine guns were optional in the rear cockpit facing aft. And though they had their limitations, they did provide a nasty sting. From Poland to Norway, Holland, Belgium and France, the initial combat forays of the Ju-87 proved extraordinarily successful. Almost overnight, the aircraft became a legend. Its bombs were dropped on targets with stunning accuracy. And the psychological effect its screaming siren had on targeted populations was uncanny. Though Nazi land forces were discovered later to have been at a numerical disadvantage, the Ju-87's ability to offset this proved decisive. Nazi ground forces were spearheaded by Stuka advance strikes against the enemy. This softening of enemy defenses effectively multiplied the effect of a small land-borne force and gave added credibility to the blitzkrieg form of quick attack. Initially flying unopposed over the European countryside, JU-87s gained a stature in the Luftwaffe and a reputation among Nazi ground forces that far outstripped the aircraft's actual accomplishments. Though an admittedly precedent-setting bombing platform, it was not, as the Nazis would soon discover, invulnerable. Perhaps the zenith of the Stuka's service was reached during the early stages of World War II, when European skies were controlled by the Luftwaffe, and victories at Dunkirk and over France were inflating Nazi morale. The aircraft had by this time achieved an amazing record for pinpoint accuracy. By the end of the war, it would sink more Allied ships than all other combat aircraft combined, and its effect against tanks would be second only to the Russian Stomovy. Boudet's belief in the dive bombing philosophy and his support for the Ju-87 enhanced his standing with the German high command. At the beginning of World War II, the Stuka proved an ace card for Hermann Goering and Adolf Hitler. Even Italy's fascist leader Benito Mussolini became enamored of the aircraft and samples were sent to the Italian Air Force for use in North Africa. France had collapsed. Dunkirk had settled into an historical embarrassment for the British. And the Stuka had seen its most significant success of the war. While Hitler and his Nazi cronies trumpeted the arrival of the Third Reich, the Allies licked their wounds and assessed their tactical options. Undoubtedly, the Stuka epitomized the early success of all blitzkrieg operations. These successes only helped Hitler to consolidate further his hold over the Wehrmacht. Prior to the gains in France, the army had secretly plotted his demise, considering such successes unachievable. But in the light of German victories in the first few months of the Second World War, the rebels within the military fell silent. Party discipline was rigid as Germany savored its success and prepared for total victory in Europe. Until the Battle of Britain, the Ju-87 had operated virtually unopposed. Over land and sea, air cover had been provided by Luftwaffe fighters and enemy anti-aircraft artillery had been all but neutralized by Nazi land forces. Terminal velocity dives went unhindered and Stuka pilots were given the privilege of concentration, which was a necessity if a bomb were to be placed accurately on target. The Stuka's successes were dependent on its ability to roll into a near vertical attitude over the target. The centerline bombs, which weighed anywhere from 250 to over 1,000 pounds, were released by a trapeze, which swung down and forced the weapon to clear the propeller disc. Because of G-forces, an automatic dive recovery system was developed, which forced the aircraft to pull up at approximately 1,800 feet, whether the pilot initiated stick action or not. 
as the British vacated the continent, the Wehrmacht had merely a mopping up function to perform. It had time to consolidate, time to assess its positions, and time to savor its gains. From now on, Germany would control the order of battle, and it must have seemed to all the world that the German juggernaut was simply irresistible. But there was one target left. The thorn in Hitler's side was England. He had either to treat with the British or annihilate them. The latter course called for Stuka activity. As the Luftwaffe chased the last British and French troops into the sea, they forced them to leave behind vast quantities of weapons and supplies, material the Allies could ill afford to lose, and some of which would even be utilized by the Germans. A pathetic end to the Allied expeditionary force, which should have stopped the Wehrmacht in Belgium. Even before Dunkirk, the German High Command was laying plans for Operation Sea Lion, the invasion and occupation of the British Isles. But first, control of the English Channel and the seas around Britain was necessary. And again, the Luftwaffe was seen as the logical weapon to deny Britain its lifeline to America and its only possible link with survival. Certainly, the British Merchant Marine and the docks that serviced it were the jugular of the last free nation in Europe. Using flying boat reconnaissance planes, the Luftwaffe scoured the British coastal seas, looking for maritime targets. As soon as they were identified, the information was quickly radioed to swarms of JU-87s, poised to sever the British supply line. In the dark days immediately after Dunkirk, Stukas were able to cause havoc for British shipping. But soon, the dive bomber's superiority was to be challenged, and its weaknesses exposed. The Battle of Britain not only changed the face of the war, but also ended for all time the Stuka's legend of invulnerability. When finally confronted head-on by a determined and well-equipped air force, the Luftwaffe capitulated. And more particularly, the Ju-87 was found to be an extremely vulnerable target. Stuka losses, in fact, were so devastating, the type was singled out for its failure and pointedly removed from the Battle of Britain arena. Spitfires and Hurricanes, perhaps the most effective Allied combat aircraft of their day, found the slow and sluggish Ju-87 an easy kill. Once the type's vulnerability and failure over England had soaked in with the Luftwaffe's hierarchy, the Ju-87 was relegated to less intense combat scenarios. This proved a relief to Stuka flight crews, as losses had mounted steadily and morale had declined rapidly. They bombed quite successfully, but they had terrible losses. Yeah, they were uh, just for the Spitfire, it was nothing. The, the gun, uh, the, or the gunner itself, he was not able to, to get a Spitfire down, and therefore they were drawn back and no more use. Though the Stuka myth was now debunked, the type remained an integral and critical part of the German war plan. In fact, though successes over England had been minimal and the aircraft had proved extremely vulnerable to enemy action, production orders for the Stuka had been increased even as the Battle of Britain rolled to a close. Reassessment of the Stuka's role now led to the conclusion that the aircraft had in fact been more of an adjunct to the old-fashioned gunnery and foot soldier rather than vice versa. Though the Luftwaffe and its Ju-87s had stunned and confused enemy forces, it was now realized that in fact it was the infantry and the artillery that had secured the conquered lands. The German high command discounted the Luftwaffe's failure over Britain as it made plans for another front. Russia. In spite of the fact that its bubble of invincibility had been burst, the Ju-87's work was far from over. Its use in North Africa, supporting Kesselring and the Africa Corps, 
and in Russia, Yugoslavia, and wherever else the Nazi juggernaut found itself, proved of inestimable value in what few victories the Nazis would realize from now to the cessation of hostilities. Hans Ulrich Rudel, eventually to become the most famous of the Luftwaffe Stuka pilots, finally logged over 2,500 operational missions in the aircraft, attacking every conceivable target, including a Russian battleship. He destroyed over 500 enemy tanks and was himself shot down at least a dozen times. He flew the Ju-87 until the last few weeks of the war, losing a leg in the process and suffering other debilitating injuries as well. While the Allied forces began their massive build-up to D-Day, German forces attempted to maintain parity and a high level of morale. Though the Battle of Britain had signaled a change in the tide of war, combat remained intense on both sides, and Hitler remained convinced victory was only months away. In North Africa, Kesselring and the Africa Corps were fighting, without realizing it, to the death with the Allies. Though British forces were meeting with heavy resistance, the arrival of the Americans and the rapid build-up of both manpower and machinery were slowly shifting the advantage to the Allies. In a repetition of the combat situation over Europe, the Ju-87 was having a field day in undefended skies. Within months of the arrival of competent Allied fighters, such as the British Hawker Hurricane and the American Curtis Warhawk, this success would be neutralized, and Stuka pilots would once again realize their extraordinary vulnerability. Even more frustrating for the Axis powers would be the Allied counterattacks with bombing missions of their own. The Douglas A-20 Havoc, seen wearing British markings, proved devastatingly effective against the Africa Corps and other fascist forces, which now found themselves as vulnerable as the Allies had been during the early days of the Stuka's combat debut. Once again, the loss of air superiority had shown the Achilles heel of the Ju-87. Allied counterattacks proved stunningly effective and resulted in considerable loss of life and massive destruction of property. Samples of virtually every aircraft in the German and Italian air forces fell victim to the Allied attacks. Many were captured, most simply destroyed. As the war in Africa wound down, Kesselring and his deputies continued to wear a facade of imminent victory. And in Germany, as the war became decidedly more desperate, Hitler also acted out a charade of invincibility, while the world around him was about to collapse in flames and chaos. But there were two small victories still in the offing, Yugoslavia and Greece. In both cases, the tried and tested method of blitzkrieg would be employed. High-speed assault by tracked vehicles streaming through the towns and villages of rural Yugoslavia achieved the same results as in Belgium and Holland. The rough Yugoslavian countryside was to provide the cover that protected their particularly tenacious resistance movement that was to form later. But in April 1941, the Wehrmacht, catching the inhabitants by surprise and completely outnumbering them, simply stormed through the country. Again, it was a job for the Stuka. Over 400 of this and similar types were employed in the Yugoslavian campaign. They flew with virtual impunity as the Yugoslav's humble air force was totally outclassed. In many ways, this was the Stuka's natural element. The steep hills and valleys confined much of the German land transport to established roads and tracks, but the Stukas could pick off otherwise inaccessible targets. Within days, both Yugoslavia and Greece fell to the same proven tactics of Blitzkrieg. <laughs> 